Well, welcome, welcome. As I said, uh, this is about the prophet Jeremiah. And I need to just tell you from the get-go, Jeremiah, by volume, is the biggest book in all of Scripture. Let that alone just say, we are not going to go through all of it. If any of you happen to remember, we spent, what was it, uh, 14 weeks going through the book of Jude, which is only 20 some odd verses. Uh, Could you imagine me going at that pace through Jeremiah? I know Dan went through uh, Isaiah in a little over two years, and he just blasted through several chapters in one message a few times. My goal and intention for this is very different. Jeremiah is unique as a prophet in that we have insights into his mind and his thought process more than any other prophet. Arguably, more than any other person in Scripture, including Moses, potentially Paul. Jeremiah asks questions. Jeremiah responds to the message he was just given to preach and present to the people. Jeremiah is rebuked by the Lord a number of times for uh, interceding on behalf of the people. God tells him a few times, don't do this. And (laughs) almost immediately after that, he breaks into some sort of a a quasi-intercessory lament. It's a fascinating thing. The reason that this really came to my mind is in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 10, which we'll touch on next week, there's one little verse right there that is just striking. And I encourage you to read that for next week and get ready. But for today as we begin, I just want to ask a simple question. What are some of your general perceptions of the Old Testament prophets? What are they like? What are some of their characteristics? Just just off the top of your head. Reluctant. I'm sorry, I heard somebody in the back. What's that? Sad, sometimes, but you're really describing Jeremiah specifically. Say that again. Frustrated. Yeah, at times, I mean, being told, uh, here I'm going to go send you on a mission, specifically think of what Ezekiel says, right? God says, I'm going to go send you to this people, and they aren't going to listen to anything you say. (laughs) Man, that's that's a job perk, right? How much do you think that they understand and know the law? which is all they would have, right? The law and some of Haftorah. How much do you think they know it? How much do you think they live out godly, spirit-filled lives all the time? All the time? time? Well, what do you think about them? (gasps) They're very much like us. You know, that really is one of those things that is true and I would say, I know that, right? They're just people just like you and I are. But in my mind, they're always somehow, you know, they just function at a high level that, you know, it, it's beyond the reach of me, of anybody. That's, that's how I tend to think about these guys. Amos, especially, is one of my favorite prophets because Amos strikes me as the kind of person that's a redneck. He's kind of a hillbilly, and he's just off halfway muttering to himself. But his thoughts and his little mutterings are exactly what God is thinking and muttering to himself. And that's fascinating. And, and I tend to think of Isaiah, highly educated, using language that is very sophisticated, very elite, right? And so he just, he already is at this level, and then he has these profound insights using incredibly well-crafted language. I mean, he, he, just, he just functions at this level, you know? Jeremiah is really different. Jeremiah is strikingly different. Let's begin to look at this. Turn with me, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 1. And I'm just going to tell you, as I, it is in my, uh, my, I guess my general nature to just think of Jeremiah as being one of these guys that is, has it all together from day one. You know, he just, he knows it, he's got it pieced together, and he can just preach it with a vigor and uh, an intensity. But that's really not the case. And as I've been reading Jeremiah a bunch lately, it's really been striking to me how far along Jeremiah is brought by the Lord. 
And so that really is going to be the focus of this particular study in the book of Jeremiah, is those interactions between Jeremiah the prophet and the Lord that help move Jeremiah along in his understanding of the Lord and of his ability to speak to the people of his day. In my mind, his day is not terribly different than ours in a lot of ways. The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim. I was told to slow down for the names. <laughs> uh, the son of, let me see, Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, until the exile of Jerusalem in the fifth month. Later on, I'll tell you a little bit about the structure of the scroll. His ministry goes beyond what he even says here in the introduction. The reason for that is somewhat fascinating, uh, but we'll get to that a little bit later on. Suffice it to say, his ministry begins, as was said right here, in the days of Josiah, in the 13th year of his reign. Let's flip to 2 Kings chapter 21. And we'll set the stage a little bit for the 13th year of his reign. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I shouldn't say the 13th year of his reign. We're going to set the stage for Josiah's reign in general. But the reason I want to begin in chapter 21 of 2 Kings is because this sets the spiritual and political climate for King Josiah. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king and reigned, get this, 55 years in Jerusalem. Let me just tell you, Manasseh is Josiah's grandfather. Okay? So keep this in mind. Manasseh is going to reign for 55 Five years. How much impact can a king have in 55 years? The simple answer is a lot. He did evil in the sight of the Lord according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord dispossessed before the sons of Israel. He replicated everybody the Israelites were supposed to have kicked out. He rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah, his father, had destroyed. He erected the altars for Baal and made an Asherah as Ahab, king of Israel, had done. And he worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. He built altars in the house of the Lord, which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem I will put my name. He built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Remember, we're talking about the temple. He made his own son passed through the fire. I mean, did you catch that? That's human sacrifice of his own son. The king just did this. He practiced witchcraft. He used divination and dealt with mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. It goes on and on for a while about all the things the, that uh, Manasseh did. <clears throat> the Lord responds because of Manasseh. Now the Lord spoke through his servants, the prophets. I'm in verse 10. Because Manasseh, king of Judah, has done these abominations, having done wickedly more than all the Amorites who were before him, and has also made Judah sin with his idols, Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such calamity on Jerusalem and Judah that whoever hears of it, both his ears will tingle. I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab, 
Remember, those cities, Samaria and uh, uh, the northern kingdom, are already in exile to Assyria. I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. I will abandon the remnant of my inheritance and deliver them into the hand of their enemies, and they will become as plunder and spoil to their enemies. Because they have done this evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came up from Egypt, even to this day. There's the Lord's response to Manasseh. Moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood until he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another, besides his sin, with which he made Judah sin, doing evil in the sight of the Lord. Fifty-five years this guy was king. Let me just tell you, it is believed that during the reign of Manasseh is when the law, the Torah scroll, the scroll, the book of the law, was lost. It was lost in the temple. Maybe lost isn't even the right word. It was neglected to the point that it was forgotten. And no one even cared, tried, looked for, sought it out, remembered that it was there. It escaped known existence during this guy's reign. 55 years. Now look, Manasseh died. His son Ammon was 22 years old when he became king. He reigned two years in Jerusalem. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, as Manasseh his father had done. Blah, blah, blah. He was put to death. Josiah, the very next king, Manasseh's grandson now, was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidiah, the daughter of Adiah, of, you know, hard name, whatever. Uh, <laughs> but look, I'm in chapter 22 now, verse 2. He did right in the sight of the Lord, and he walked in all the way of, look how far back we can go to find out, the, the stature, the measure against which Josiah can be graded. He did, uh, he walked in all the way of his father David, nor did he turn aside from the right to the left. Good king. Very good king. But here's the fascinating thing now. Look at this next verse. In what year? I'm in verse 3. In what year? The 18th year of King Josiah the king sent a handful of people to go rebuild the temple of the Lord. I'm going to pause with the scripture right here. Is there a slide that uh, can be put up, the very first one? I don't have the... Is anybody up there? I know this is not a real convenient slide to see, and I'm sorry about that. If any of you were around several years ago when we went through uh, the kings of Israel and Judah... Uh, this is the exact same chart that we used then. It's a fairly detailed one. Uh, if you would like a copy of it, I think we can still order more. It's a large piece of paper. It's quite detailed. In my mind, it's a very helpful thing. The hard thing to see here, though, in this particular case, is that Jeremiah's reign— I, Actually, can any of you even see that? Is it— Yeah, we're too spread out. You know what? The gist of it is, 13 years— into Josiah's reign is the call of, Jer of Jeremiah, right? Thirteen years in, we read that. Now, look at this next little verse right here, though. In the 18th year of Josiah's reign is when they begin remodeling the temple. Uh, well, I don't know, is it, you know, already gone, never mind. Read into that now. Five years after Jeremiah's call, the temple is being remodeled, and look at this. This is just fascinating. What on earth did they discover? They remodel the temple. Okay, they deliver the money and blah, 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 and I'm in verse 8 now. Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. Listen to this. Five years after Jeremiah is called as a prophet, they find the scroll of the law. Had it been read previous to that? Not in Jeremiah's lifetime. 
probably not in living memory of a substantial portion of the population of the day. This is who Jeremiah is being called to go minister to. And oh, by the way, this sets the stage for what Jeremiah's spiritual training looks like. Jeremiah is a priest. And the priests haven't even had the book of the law in known memory for at least, I don't know exactly how many years, way more than it should have been. Fix that in your mind. The priests don't even have God's word. We found the book of the law. The book of the law gets taken to the king. I am in verse 11 now. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, this is righteous King Josiah, he tore his clothes. The king commanded Hilkiah and a handful of people, verse 13, go inquire of the Lord for me and the people and all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that burns against us because our fathers have not listened to the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. So Hilkiah the priest and a handful of people went to find, look at this, they don't go to Jeremiah, right, who has been ministering now, who has been called at least for five years. They go to Huldah, the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikva, the son of Haras, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she lived in Jerusalem, blah, blah, blah. And she said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, tell the man who sent you to me, thus says the Lord. Behold, I am bringing evil on this place and on its inhabitants, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah has read, because they have forsaken me and have burned incense to other gods that they might provoke me to anger with all the work of their hands. Therefore, my wrath burns against this place, and it shall not be quenched. Get that in your mind. The words are confirmed. The judgment for disobedience, rebellion, and sin is coming. Okay, we've read that a couple of times, referring to both Manasseh and now here, right? As, uh, as this scroll was read to Josiah the king, and he seeks counsel about it. But to the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus you shall say to him, thus says the Lord God of Israel, regarding the words which you have heard, because your heart was tender, and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard all that I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse. And you have torn your clothes and wept before me. Truly, I have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will gather you to your fathers, and you will be gathered to your grave in peace. Your eyes will not see all the evil which I will bring on this place. So they brought back the word to the king. Josiah does a lot with this. He takes this message and the book of the law, which he just read, and or excuse me, heard being read to him very much to heart. He begins an aggressive campaign of purging idolatry from his kingdom, from his uh, immediate, you know, area that he's in control of. But he goes even beyond the borders of his kingdom into the northern kingdom at some points. Purging of idolatry. The people now have the copy of the law, and he actively promulgates its reading and teaching. Josiah is a great king, okay? He is a very good king. That's why we still name some children within our community Josiah, right? Because that is the measure of the statue we would hope that he would, you know, that child would live up to. Josiah is a great king. But hear it very clearly. One righteous king is like a speed bump of the general people's road headed to judgment. And that's about it. And so five years before the scroll is even found, Jeremiah gets called. Let's go back to Jeremiah really quickly now. Back in chapter 1. <clears throat> the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah, by birth, is a priest. 
He makes that very clear in, in uh, the very beginning of his book. And let me just say very interestingly, there is a distinct possibility that he is related to Eli, the priest, and that this fulfills certain prophecies coming from Samuel. If you want to know more about that later, I would be happy to tell you about it. But he is a priest by birth. He is a prophet by calling. And as being called, I know that this verse is really fascinating, especially this weekend, right? Uh, the March for Life normally would be happening right about now. And this is about the 47th anniversary of Roe versus Wade being handed down. Oh yeah, by the way, that's like, I'm a September 73 year, uh, 1973 baby. So this weekend is like about the time, you know, my mom would be horrified if she knew I ever even pieced that together. You get where I'm going with that. Anyways, it is very fair to say that each person's life is known intimately, dearly, and they are created with a purpose by God. Jeremiah's purpose is made very clear right here. I am sending you to speak to the nations. Jeremiah responds, but look, I don't know how to speak. I am a youth. The Lord said to me, do not say you are a youth. Let me just say that word youth is a very general term. It can be like lad, uh, servant boy, child, um, a kid, we might even say. Age range, why? It is used for people that are quasi-infants to around 20. Very frequently, it is somebody who is in their very early teens, adolescent, something like that. So we don't know exactly, <coughs> excuse me, how old Jeremiah is. Young. That's all we need to know. Old enough that he is not a child in his parents' house. Okay, he does have the capacity to go, to move about, to speak authoritatively on behalf of the Lord. But he by no means is old enough, as in 30, right, when a priest would normally ascend to his role in priesthood or something like that. He's young. And the Lord says, look, don't let that be a deterrent. Don't put that forward as an obstacle to be disobedient somehow. Do not, excuse me, because everywhere I send you, you shall go. Remember that word can be used as servant lad, like a servant boy kind of thing. You will go. And all that I command you, you, will, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Already set up is that, Jeremiah, there is going to be opposition. I am with you. From day one, Jeremiah, opposition is coming. I am with you. I am with you. Man, let that sink into Jeremiah's mind. Let it sink into our mind. So the Lord stretched out his hand, and he touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to pluck up and break down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. With words, with my words that are authoritative. The first little thing Jeremiah sees is fascinating. Verse 11. The word of the Lord came to me saying, What do you see, Jeremiah? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Uh, do we, oh, let's see, I have the thing here. Do we have the third slide? Can you read that? A little-known yet significant factor assisting the Jews in regulating their calendar, and let me just say, this comes from a book by uh, uh, Jones, Dr. Floyd Nolan Jones, on chronology. And the reason this talks about keeping time is because the system of dating kings goes from spring to spring. And so in this book of chronology, he points this out, but it has bearing on this passage. A little-known yet significant factor assisting the Jews was the presence of the almond tree, which was indigenous to the land of Israel. The Hebrew word for almond, sheked, which literally means the watcher, the awakener, the alerter, or to watch. That's what they call the almond tree, okay? That's the name for it because... The tree is the first one to awaken from a dormant sleep or death of winter, putting forth its conspicuous white or possible pomegranate blossoms so that everyone can see it. 
So that's the name of the tree, right? The watcher, the awakener, the alerter, something along those lines. Uh, bear in mind, by the way, uh, what is it, Matthew, Matthew 24, right? When Yeshua is speaking and he says, hey, keep in mind the parable of the fig tree, right? The fig tree, when it puts forth its blossoms and its branches kind of softer, you know, you know that summer is coming. Fig tree, summer, almond tree, springtime. So, but, but the key word here is it, it, it's the watcher. It's the awakener. And so look, as soon as you look out and you see that almond branch and those first few little blossoms, you know that what's coming. You know spring is just around the corner. God says, you're right. You have seen well, for I am, see that, watching over my word to perform it. I am, instead of uh, shaked, it's like shakad. It's just one little letter changing it, just a hair. But the gist of that message is to say what? You saw the blossoms on the tree. You know what's coming. Listen, everything that has been foretold to you, here it is. The blossoms on the branch, get ready. It's just around the corner. It is eminent. It is eminent. If we could go back to that timeline chart now for just a second. I don't know where to point this. The simple crux of it is this. Josiah, oh, there we go. I don't know if you can really see it very well. Josiah is right here. He ascends to the throne. Okay, right here is Jeremiah being called. Down here is the book of the law being discovered. And that one says 622, I think. When was the first deportation out of Jerusalem? 605. The second deportation, 597. The third deportation, when the temple was destroyed, the city was raised, 586. All of these things, all of these events are going to happen in Jeremiah's lifetime. As a youth, he's called. As a youth, he sees the almond branch, and God says, it's time. It's coming. Get ready. He makes a fascinating second little statement, or, or he gives a second little vision to Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to me a second time, saying, what do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot facing away from the north. Then the Lord said to me, out of the north, evil will break forth on all the inhabitants of the land. For behold, I am calling all the families of the kingdom of the north, declares the Lord. And they will come, and they will each one set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem, and against all its walls round about, and against all the cities of Judah. I will pronounce my judgment, judgments on them concerning all their wickedness whereby they have forsaken me and have offered sacrifices to other gods and worshiped the works of their own hands. Judgment is coming. It's coming from the north. It's coming in an overwhelming manner. Get ready. And now very specifically to Jeremiah. You, Jeremiah, gird up your loins and arise. That's a little bit of an idiom. What does it mean? We might use another idiom. Strap on your boots and get ready for work. It's a little bit of an athletic term, which is to say, tighten up those things that hold you in place physically. Get ready to run. That's what he's saying to Jeremiah. Arise and speak to them all which I command you. Do not be dismayed before them, or I will dismay you before them. Now behold, I have made you today as a fortified city and as a pillar of iron and as walls of bronze against the whole land to the kings of Judah, to its princes, to its priests, and to all the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they will not overcome you, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Jeremiah, get ready. Get ready for action. You're going to go. I have a message. I want you to preach to the people. Don't be afraid of them. 
Don't be afraid because you're a youth. Don't be afraid of their ideas. Don't be afraid of their position. Did you catch the positions that he mentioned right there? Kings, the whole government, the priesthood, the religious establishment, and all of the general people. The totality of the people you will interact with. Quite a number of times it's fascinating to me that mentioned in Jeremiah are prince, wait, uh, king, princes, priesthood, prophets. Those four groups of people are repeatedly mentioned and Jeremiah stands in opposition to all of them. Man, that's got to be a little bit overwhelming. That's just got to be rough. And, and the Lord even says, look, don't be dismayed. Don't quiver before them. Don't uh, recoil. Have no fear as you stand before this people because what? I am the one standing with you. Right? Wow. They will fight against you, but they will not overcome you. I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Remember back in that initial question, man, what is Jeremiah like as a person? What are the prophets in general like? Jeremiah is a kid. He's a kid who grew up without having the law. I would certainly hope now that oral tradition would still be there, such that Jeremiah, as a priest, would have heard, retold, the stories of the Lord's faithfulness. The stories of how they became priests. What it means to be a priest. You know, some of the nature of the Lord. I don't know that. I strongly suspect it. I mean, he's, he seems to have some good idea of some things about the Lord. But I'm just going to tell you my, uh, my guess is that really, his biggest understanding of what the Lord is really like doesn't come from reading or hearing anything else except for his direct interactions with the Lord. This is really going to come out next week when we get to chapter 4, verse 10. That's really my, my suspicion. But for the moment, let me just pause again here and say, look, in our day and age, we already have an advantage over Jeremiah. What are some of them? We have the whole book in our hands. Yes, we have the whole thing right here. It's beyond just the initial Torah scroll. It's beyond half Torah. It's complete, right? And we, we still have it. We have lots and lots of copies of it. We probably have 15 of them in our household. And, and now we have this little nifty keychain in the lobby, by the way. You can scan the QR code and download, right? We have loads of access to Scripture. What else is another big advantage that we have? <gasps> That's a big one! The Holy Spirit! Look, for those of us who are believers, we are sealed with the Spirit, right? It dwells in us in a way that it never did for an Old Testament, an Old Covenant believer. They, Old Covenant people, right, had unique callings, unique, I, I, I don't know, maybe I'm going to use a wrong word here, empowerings, something like that. You know, last time we went through Samson, think about that. The Lord rushed upon him mightily, and all of a sudden, his physical strength is well beyond that of a normal human being, right? We know that that happened to Saul. We know it happened to, you know, fill in the blank. Lots of different people. We have the permanent indwelling of the Spirit in us now, fully, for all time, not taken away. Not temporary, not momentary, permanently there. More than what Jeremiah would have had. Boy, I'm thinking of a verse now from the New Testament, right? The one who is least in the kingdom of God is? And that's why. Right? We have more than what Jeremiah had. So I think in some ways the same message really could be given to us. Look, before you were born, God says to each and every human being, I created you, I knew you intimately, I knew you personally, and I have a purpose for your life. Walk in it. 
And when the time comes for you to step up to that purpose, to walk in the, into the calling for which I have called you specifically, that work which I have set aside ahead of time for you to walk in and to fulfill and do, I am with you to do it. Don't be dismayed by out there. I am with you. Opposition's coming. Man, this is so timely. Think about as Dan has been preaching through Revelation. Look, the blossoms are on the almond branch, okay? The fig tree has its blossom out too, right? Look, everything that God has said is coming. It is imminent. It is just around the corner. Be ready. Don't be afraid. I am the one who is going to strengthen and stand with and protect you. And if you don't know much about the story of Jeremiah, I'm just going to give you a little heads up. It's miserable. It is miserable. He has, by all means, what I would consider a miserable life. Okay? He spends an awful lot of time in prison. He spends an awful lot of time in stocks and bonds. He gets thrown into a well where he sinks into the mud, left there to die. He is dragged off against his will to a handful of places. One of them, of course, is Egypt, where he adamantly did not want to go, where the king of Babylon came and conquered it a second time. He is the one that stood there saying, look, the famine is coming in the land, and here's why it's happening, and everybody is against him and not wanting to hear this message. Everybody stands against him. Let me just say, for our day and age, how eager is our culture, our employers, our neighbors, our media to hear, hey, guess what? Sin is real, judgment is coming, morality and ethics matter. Man, there's a really popular message all of a sudden, isn't it? But I think God says the exact same thing to us. When you are speaking my words— doing it in the strength and guidance of my spirit, I am still going to be with you. Don't be dismayed by them. So to young Jeremiah, as I hope we will begin seeing soon, Jeremiah catches what God is saying and doing to him. And it is so overwhelming and so captivating and so awe-inspiring to him that all the other messages he hears from out there, he consistently listens to the message. Well, may we do so too. Our time is up. Let me encourage you next week to read Jeremiah chapter 4 and 5. But specifically, we're going to spend a couple of weeks just in Jeremiah's observation in verse 10. I'll even tell you what it is. It's just absolutely fascinating. Surely, God, Lord God, you have utterly deceived this people, declaring there will be peace, whereas a sword touches the throat. Man, that guy's dramatic. I love it. It's just a great passage. We'll get there next week. In the meantime, our Father and our King, thank you so much for this time that we have together. This, that we live in a country that, where we have the liberty and the freedom to have your word to read it, to study it, to gather together, to piece it together, to mull it over in our minds. Oh, Father, thank you for that, that awesome privilege. And with that privilege and responsibility, help us to walk in faithful obedience, in declaring it, in proclaiming it, in teaching it, in speaking it to our neighbors, lovingly and firmly, as you would lead us to do. Open my ears, open all of our ears to the prompting of your Spirit that our words would go and minister to our neighbors and our culture. In Yeshua's name, amen.